Thank you, and uh, good evening. Um, uh, before I go into the, those lessons, I want to show something. Because <laughs> we are very busy this, uh, this last week with uh, our national uh, soccer or uh, football team, because we have the European Championship. And, uh, well, I think a lot of you may know it, but uh, for, the, for the Dutch that's very important. And, that means that uh, our whole country is slowly getting more orange. So, if you stay longer, you will see it getting more and more orange. Like this. this is the... And you can see orange cars and all kinds of uh, things. Orange, as, as, as long as it's orange, it's okay. <laughs> Until we lose, then it's over. <laughs> and we mostly lose somewhere. Okay, but I want to talk to you too about uh, to you about water. And um, first thing also I want to mention is that water is not only important for us in summer, of course uh, it is, but also in winter because uh, we really like to skate. And this doesn't look like water, but it's ice, and uh, we like ice skating. So uh, this is one aspect of, uh, of water. But what's more important, uh, and when I talk about uh, let's say the lessons learned, I want to talk about water management in the Netherlands. And um, as you see here, uh, the Netherlands is a very low-lying country. Uh, that means that part of the country is below sea level. And along the rivers there are also parts that are be below the levels of uh, the sea. So a lot of uh, uh, part, a big part of the country is vulnerable for floodings. So that's very important to understand. And that's why we also are so keen of, of let's looking at our uh, water management. But we have made many mistakes, and I will show them afterward. Just the first some impression. If you look here, then you see uh, a bird eye view of, of the, the landscape in the south uh, Delft and the Hague and uh, Amsterdam. And we're now a little bit uh, north of Amsterdam, somewhere where this A7 is uh, called. And uh, this is when there's no problem and uh, low sea levels, but suppose we didn't have our defense against the sea, then what would happen? What would happen during low tides would, would be something like this. There's a lot of the country is underwater. And high tide, so this happens then every day, high tide is even worse. So, you understand that uh, water management is a vital uh, for the Dutch. And especially also because most of the people uh, who are living in the Netherlands are living in this area which is below the sea level. And also the economy, mostly of it, is concentrated there. So, for us, the defense against floods is very important and especially also from the sea. And here you see the, the, the Dutch coast. And we have, in general, we have, let's say, a, a soft uh, <coughs> defense. What, what we call is that we uh, use sand from the sea to, uh, to keep our dunes intact. But at some places we uh, need hard defense, like uh, dams, just to protect us from the sea. And this has to be controlled over and over again because it's so very important. But let me go to, uh, to how we did get our policy and in fact what, what happened is that we, uh, we learned a lot from our mistakes and that's in fact how our policy uh, yeah, became uh, uh, a reality because we made many mistakes and I will show some of them just to, uh, to make you understand how we did it. During the centuries we had many problems, many flood problems and uh, here you see a picture of uh, dike breaches over, the, let's say, the, the last uh, 300 uh, years, 250 years, and there are many of them, and these are mostly in the, uh, uh, in the river uh, area. And so we get uh, dike breaches, we had that many, many people were killed, 10,000 of people during all those years. So that was a hard lesson to learn, and uh, it also uh, was the reason that at a certain moment, it was decided that we could not, let's say, uh, make 
uh, solve the problem by every time uh, restoring uh, the breach, but we should have a, a policy where all the, the, the river branches are in, and then there was a special organization uh, made, it was, it's called the Rijkswaterstaat, which is the national uh, organization for water management for our big waters. And um, what we saw is, and what we did wrong is that we were too much fragmented in our river management. There were local uh, problems, but then we solved them with local uh, uh, projects, but not a combined approach. The other thing is that if you make a solution for a local uh, problem, then you can have downstream, you can, can have even worse problems. And also, uh, there was no uh, thinking and no policy uh, of water management on a river basin scale. So we, as I said, had to learn that and that's why the state organization was made. It doesn't mean that then all the problems were solved, but it was an important step in it. This, this is another part of the country. Um, it's very near where we are. Thank you. We're about uh, here now, falling down. And um, this was, it used to be an, uh, uh, an inner sea, you can say. It was in, in connection with the North Sea. And what happened is that there were so many uh, yeah, floods that, that attacked the land that the sea became bigger and bigger. And uh, there were always, always a situation with damage and with people uh, who were killed. And then there was an, an, uh, in 1916 there was a, se a serious flood again. And there weren't, were not so many people killed, but uh, there was a big difference, uh, big, uh, sorry, uh, damage again. And then uh, the government decided on plans that were already made before to, to make them, uh, uh, to realize them. And this, these plans were called the Zuider Zee Works. And it more or less, the, the, the principle is that let's say this Zuider Zee, which you can see is in open branch with the, uh, with the North Sea, uh, that, we're going, that we wanted to close this sea, this, this inner sea from the North Sea. So first we made uh, a polder just to test out if we could make those, those dikes. This was the first step and it was done in 1930. And so we also got some new land there. And then when we succeeded in that, we made this dam, it's called the Afsluit Dyke, and this closed, let's say, this inner uh, sea from the North Sea. And this also meant that this inner sea became slowly a uh, uh, freshwater uh, reservoir, because the river, one of the branches of the river Rhine is flowing into this sea, and slowly the, the salt water is disappearing and is, uh, let's say, becoming uh, fresh water, and this is also very important for our water management. But it was also possible, as, as I showed, uh, to make polders here, and this was part of the plan, to make new land. And uh, in, 40, in 1948 there was a new polder uh, made, North Coast Polder it was called, and you can see there were two islands which used to be in the sea. They were now inside the polder. And we went on like that. There came another uh, big polar in 1957. And still one in 1968. And they had, of course, the, the advantage that there was new land, uh, which was possible to use it for agriculture and so on. And then there were ideas to make another polar. It was, should be a Markabat, it's in the south uh, west end, but uh, then there came protests from the people and they said, well, we have, we have uh, uh, put away, uh, or let's say, taken in too much water, we should not go on with that. So only the first dam of this polder was made, uh, and it's now a connection with a road on, on it, of course, but this, this other polder was never made. But it shows, let's say, that uh, the problem of, uh, of this uh, vulnerable area was with many people killed with a lot of damage. It was more or less uh, finished by making this uh, dam, this upslide dam, uh, disclosure dam, and also uh, using 
the, the, uh, the land also for uh, agriculture and so on. So it was a better safety, better water management because we have this fresh water reservoir now, uh, better connections because uh, you could drive from one side to the other, soil for agriculture, space for cities and also natural uh, areas. So that was an, a lesson learned in, in the north. Then we got a very big attack in 1953 in the southwest of the country. Here um, there was a province which is called Zeeland, and in 1953 there was a very big storm and a lot of uh, uh, dikes were, uh, were breaching and a lot of people uh, came into uh, uh, problems and we had about 2,000 people killed uh, in a few days and this was really a terrible disaster and that was again such a learning moment we should have done it before of course but then the government said this should not happen again so they decided to uh, as a uh, reaction to start what they call a delta project and I can only tell you, let's say, some, some headlines of it. This is, uh, let's say, the last, one of the last things of this Delta project, which was made. It was an, uh, an open uh, dam, uh, so in, in general the connections to the sea were closed, but the last uh, closure, uh, let's say, they made a dam where water could still go in and go out, so this uh, was better for, for ecology and for nature, so that's the reason why it was made like that, but it's a very huge construction and uh, it was a very big project and this one uh, was finished in 1986. Then there was another point which, which became uh, more and more dangerous and uh, which asked also for a solution was the, the, the area of Rotterdam and around Rotterdam where uh, when you have very high uh, sea levels you, you get uh, uh, problems with flooding and for this there was a new construction made, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a turning construction that floats on the water and then can be seen down and uh, these two arms that are made, they are very big, they are, one of them is, is as big as the Eiffel Tower in, uh, in Paris so you can understand how, how huge these, uh, this construction is and when the water level is about 3 meters above uh, the normal sea level then it closes automatically, it's not possible to, it doesn't, it's done by, uh, by people, just by the computers. And then, uh, let's say, it protects uh, Rotterdam area from, from the sea. Well, of course, the, the problems were not only problems of, uh, let's say, water quantity and, and flooding, but also problems of water quality. And only after, let's say, uh, the, the problems were very big, and the water was very bad in, in a lot of uh, places. Uh, then they decided and, uh, to, ma to uh, make a new law. And this law, uh, the Water Pollution Act, was uh, put into practice in 1970. And then already they thought uh, the first draw was made, draft was, uh, was made one, about 100 years ago. So uh, it took a long time to decide. <coughs> Only when the problems were big, they decided to, to do this. Uh, and we were in general quite successful in working for, on this water quality. Uh, we worked together in the Rhine area with the other uh, countries along the River Rhine, like Germany, France, uh, uh, Switzerland, and uh, Luxembourg. And um, the, the Rhine became slowly a better river. And then what happened is that there came an accident in uh, Switzerland with a, uh, with a factory producing pesticides and again uh, this, this accident led to new actions because we said we said we need uh, to uh, make a new action plan for the river Rhine because all the pesticides they, uh, they went into the water, you get a lot of, of dead fish uh, the ecology was really disturbed and so this was the reason why there was another uh, uh, action. And, um, well, if you look at our policy, our water pollution policy, which 
started after this problem, you can say that we had some uh, some weak points, uh, and the, the weak point was that we only started when the problems were big, and that we need disasters. Uh, but our strong points were that we did have a really clear vision for the future. We said, okay, in this we want to clear our water in 20 years, and also we succeeded in, in doing that. It's very very important to be sure to have an idea what you want to reach in what time. We made a dedicated law, which was also important to have. The organization was very well arranged, and it was, so it was clear who had to do it, and uh, it, it was also organized well. And what was one of the most important things also, there was a very good financing structure. And um, for instance, everybody was polluting, they had to pay, the polluted pay principle. And we used the pay from, uh, the, from the industries to give them subsidies again to to make uh, purification plants, and so it uh, really um, was a very good uh, policy, you could say. Then uh, we already had a long time in the 90s that we did not have high river floods, and in that time uh, everybody used to say, well. It's, it won't happen anymore. It's something from the past, and they, everybody was convinced that the dikes were <coughs> high enough, and uh, that people who said that the dikes were not high enough, they just wanted to have work for themselves or something like that, and there was not enough money to, to spend on that. And then we had two years in a row, we had uh, uh, high river floods, and then everybody uh, yeah, was shocked, because how could this happen? And uh, some 200,000 people had to leave their home because there was a danger that it would be uh, flooded and that they would uh, get drowned. So if 200,000 people have to, to leave their home, then it's a big uh, catastrophe, you, you can say, and it really makes a big impression. So again, we needed this, this almost disaster, you can say, to, to make, make a next step and to say, okay, we have to, to deal with these rivers in a better way. And, um, yeah, I already told this. <coughs> what, what we did in the past is that uh, we really made our rivers, uh, we, we, we put away all, all we take, taken away all the room from the river, and what we did, we made more or less canals, uh, like uh, small rivers with high dikes uh, al alongside it, and we thought that was very, sensitive, but on the other hand it was not, in the end it did not uh, seem to be such a good uh, policy. So we said we cannot go on this way, we should also try to give more space to the river. So this became an important uh, project. And here you see another example why, uh, why these uh, river problems uh, occurred, because in the past there was quite a lot of room for the river, a lot of space, and by building cities, uh, the, the, the river narrowed and you get higher, uh, let's say, water levels because of that and more uh, danger of, uh, of flooding. So then it was decided, again, after an almost catastrophe, I should say, uh, that we should have a project which was called uh, Room uh, for the River, and this project should uh, be finished in 2015 and should lead to better situation in the river uh, area. And one of the goals uh, of the aims was safety, but it was combined with another one because we say we said we can at the same time we can also take care of a better spatial quality. So it's a combination of, uh, of, of goals you could say. And what we also uh, found important is that uh, it should be a project which looked at the whole river system, but it should also be uh, a cooperation between all the government uh, levels. So what we did is that we uh, worked together with three ministries, five provinces, 60 water boards and 100 municipalities to make this big plan for this room for the river. and. Uh, in the end, it were almost 40 projects that were selected to, uh, to carry out. 
and uh, it's very important that, uh, let's say, uh, as I said in, in the beginning, that you cannot just uh, take one spot and make uh, make more room there. If you have to do it, you have to look at all the branches and the whole the whole river uh, system. You you see an example of one of those projects is uh, in the southern part. You see uh, the city of Nijmegen and. Uh, in the northern part, there will be an extra um, uh, branch of the river, which will cut off a piece of land, so that will be a kind of an island, but that gives the river more room again. And it, at first, everybody was against it, but by looking at what the possibilities are and what the, the, the potentials are, people became more and more enthusiastic, and uh, a lot of them are so anxious because you can make new part of the city there, people living near the water, and the safety is, is better than before. This one is a, an example of a bypass. That you make, let's say, a green river, which is not used in normal times, but maybe once in a hundred years uh, it's necessary to use it because then you have so much water in the river that, uh, that the, the normal river, river cannot cope with it. And then you have this green river. And uh, so this bypass can, can help you also to get more room for the river. Um, and one example also I want to give is interesting is uh, uh, an area uh, which is called Nordwart. It's a polder area. You see the, the, the red lines are the polder, uh, are the, the dikes around that uh, that area. And uh, in the past, it used to be a lot of uh, let's water. It was in an open connection with the river, as you can see uh, here. And because it became uh, a polder area, then uh, the room for the river had disappeared, and that meant also that upstream from this part the water levels had uh, were higher and the, the, the danger of flooding was higher so something had to be done and it was decided that we should look if we could re restore this situation again as it was in the past <coughs> so this was a kind of a sketch you can see the river flowing there and uh, well the, People looking, can we use this area again by, uh, for uh, getting, uh, for, for storing the water if there's a lot of it? But of course, there are, let's say, uh, people living there and there are uh, farmers there. So it's a difficult situation if you, uh, if you have to decide that. But what we do, did is that we uh, said we should have this process. Uh, together with uh, all the uh, inhabitants and the stakeholders, we should try to find out the best solution for, for everybody so that they understand why is it necessary, how can we, uh, say, uh, cope with the disadvantages for them, can we compensate them in one or another way, or can we uh, give them possibilities in, in the area, also in a new situation. And then, uh, by talking, there came an alternative which was, let's say, uh, designed by the people themselves. And this uh, led to uh, uh, an alternative that was also uh, chosen at the end by the State Secretary. And it looks a bit like this, that you see those open connections again. And uh, some of the areas will be nature and uh, are not so vulnerable, of course they, they can uh, have water without problem, uh, but some, some others can be used uh, as agriculture area and uh, it means that the farms have to be at the, the right level of course, that they will not uh, get trouble with it, so there will be new farms there. And um, this is what how it was done, uh, we call it uh, working on the kitchen uh, table, so people uh, sit together, they uh, make plans, they look, can we uh, have uh, another al alternative and things like that. So this process is very uh, important to, to uh, get su successful. You, you see a situation when there's uh, relatively uh, 
low uh, levels of water, then <coughs> there is more water in this area than before, but it's not uh, a lot more. This is when you get uh, situations when, when there is a higher flow, then uh, you need more of the area. You can have even a situation that you uh, need even more of the area in the ultimate situation. When there's really a heavy flood, this would be this, the, uh, what happens. And of course, then uh, it may happen once in a thousand years, for instance, if you calculate it. Uh, so uh, it will not uh, happen often, but if it happens, then people get uh, compensated, the, the farmers, for their loss of crop. And uh, also they, of course, get compensated now for uh, restructuring in this area. And this project just started uh, a few weeks ago with, uh, in, in uh, realizing, so uh, it's important. Um, well, what did we learn from this? Uh, that it's necessary to have an integrated uh, approach, uh, to involve all the government levels, communicate with the stakeholders, consider all relevant aspects, consider all possible measures, and use policy analysis as, as a tool. Um, after that, after 1993 and 95, where we had these river floods, we had problems with excess rain inside the country, so in the polar areas, and uh, it was raining so hard that we couldn't cope with the, the, the rain. And um, well, again, we said uh, we did not look out very good at, uh, before because there was urbanization and there was, uh, and we didn't. Let's say we didn't predict that this was going to happen. So again, we said there must be more space for for water also inside these polar areas, and we have to look for retention areas. And well, the last 10 years and or so, 50 there are, are being uh, constructed. Uh, important conclusions <coughs> of the experience in the Netherlands is that we. Uh, too often need uh, a disaster or a nearly disaster. And what is important is that you look at systems that are resilient. And uh, also a very important aspect is that uh, spatial planning and water management should be very good connected because often spatial planning is not looking at the, the consequences for water and then later on you get a problem. So from the, from the beginning you have to look at what does plan mean for uh, for the water situation, and this is why we developed an, uh, an instrument in our law which is called water test or water assessment, and that means that with every decision it has to be made clear what is the, the effect on uh, the water situation. Um, but what if climate change go on, because what I said now is that in fact all our policy was based on mistakes. So we made a mistake and then we made a new policy. And made another mistake and we made a new policy. And okay, you can do it like that, but it's better to, to look ahead. And so we said we have to make a plan for, for the future and we, we have to look a long time, uh, long, uh, time ahead, like uh, 100 years if possible. And that's why, let's say, um, here, for instance, there's a calculation uh, made with, uh, uh, of what could happen if the climate changes go, go on. It's, of course, one of the scenarios. It's not the, the only scenario. But then you can see that there are areas where uh, the, the water level could be 1 meter 20 higher than uh, they are now. And that means that we have to prepare for, be prepared for that. And uh, also, that's the reason why the government said, well, okay, let's just uh, start a national dialogue on our future situation. Although we know it's not really urgent, it won't be tomorrow that, that this will happen, but we have to look uh, 50 or 100 uh, years ahead what could happen. And we use, uh, the, 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 uh, let's say, the scenarios of global warming, and look what, what could it mean for, uh, for the sea level, what could it mean for uh, rain, uh, and so on. And then we look uh, what decisions do we have to make. And um, there are 
uh, certain kind of decisions that have to be made uh, in the next years. Um, this should all be in our next national uh, water plan of 2015. So the decisions have to be made in 2013 or 2014. First about our uh, standards of protection. I didn't tell much about it, but we, we think we uh, are discussing the fact that we might need stricter standards. Now the standard for the western part is one an event once in a 10,000 year, but maybe that's not good enough. Um, we have to think what to do about the Rotterdam area. Do we need more of these closure, uh, let's say, uh, barrages? Uh, um, we have to look at uh, the water level of our, our inner lake. Can it stay like that? Because what happens is that if the sea level is rising, then the, the, the water level in the lake is, is not enough to, uh, to get water out uh, at low tide, because you, the low tide is even higher than, the, than can be higher than the, uh, than the lake level. So you get a problem, and you can solve that with uh, raising the level of the, of the lake. You can also use big pumps, things like that. They have to be decided on that. Also, uh, what is a problem sometimes in dry periods is uh, uh, that we don't have enough uh, fresh water, that we get problems in our western part to, uh, in, with agriculture. So we also have to look at uh, uh, solutions for that. And uh, also, uh, how should we go on with our spatial planning in the future? So I think that's more or less the, the lessons that we learned du during all these uh, centuries, you could say, that uh, integrated water resource management means that, river, that the river should be treated in an integrated way. What we also think is there should be, as, part, if, as good as possible, one organization responsible for decision-making process. And uh, good communication and stakeholder involvement are vital. One of the most important relations is, as I said, the relation between water management and spatial planning. Uh, and, well, the natural, we should look at the natural way of water management and also uh, good water, water governance, let's say, is uh, very important. So we should not only focus on the technical aspects and on the models, but also on the behavior and on the cooperation and on uh, working together. Um, and this is about what the governance center would have worked for. Uh, so, this is what I had to tell you about lessons learned in the Netherlands on uh, water management. Thank you.